My name is Mark Smith. I am the Vice President of Animal Care here at the New England Aquarium. And it is my pleasure uh, on behalf of the Aquarium to welcome you to the lecture series. We have a great topic tonight, Living Fossil and Blue Blood, the story of the horseshoe crab and human health. Thank you all for coming here tonight to hear about an animal that I feel is super amazing, as most people in this room probably do also. And so I'm going to touch on general biology, some of the challenges they face in captivity in the wild along with diseases, and some medical management that we've tried here and elsewhere to help uh, these animals in captivity. So Limulus polyphemus, in Greek that means the odd or skewed one-eyed giant, which is a misnomer since they have at least ten eyes. They're, they're a uh, marine chelicerate arthropod closely related to uh, spiders and scorpions, more so than true crabs. And they're considered living fossils, remaining relatively unchanged for millions of years. And they inhabit coastal habitats, um, in terms of the American horseshoe crab, from Yucatan Peninsula up to the Gulf of Maine. Horseshoe crabs are considered relatively long-lived invertebrates, living upwards of 20 years, and some say they even live longer. And they tend to um, sexually mature relatively late at 9 to 11 years of age where they reach their final molt or called their terminal molt and um, those are the animals that we have here um, for the most part in Boston are the adult horseshoe crabs and those are the ones we'll be talking about in the second half of the lecture. They're very well known for their seasonal spawning that occurs typically late April to early July where they, the males and the females come ashore in big numbers at the new and full moon high tides and the female will dig a nest, lay her thousands of eggs and the males will fertilize and um, their eggs provide critical food source for many shorebird species along with the adult horseshoe crabs provide a food source for loggerhead sea turtles, sharks among others. So a little bit more background information on their blood. So blood in invertebrates is called hemolymph so we'll refer to blood or the hemolymph and there's an extract from the horseshoe crab blood called limulus amoebocyte lysate or LAL that John will be talking about in much more detail but the amoebocyte is the solo cell for the most part in the horseshoe crab in the horseshoe crab blood so they really we always talk about the amoebocyte or their only hemocyte or blood cell so this extract is critically important to the biomedical and pharmaceutical industry because it has this very sensitive ability to detect gram-negative bacterial endotoxins, so a certain type of common bacteria that's everywhere that can make people very sick and animals very sick. So there's an extract that's able to detect it in a variety of medical supplies to keep us safe. Um, they're also studied for a variety of um, physiology studies with vision and also with neurobiology. Nobel Prizes have been won with using the horseshoe crab as a model over the years. Also the chitin, so the hard part of their shell, is used for suture material and some burn dressings for people. Another use for the horseshoe crab has been to harvest them for bait for the eel and whelk industries in some states. Um, in Massachusetts it is, they are harvested for bait for this reason. Um, as John will talk about South Carolina, they are not allowed to be harvested for this purpose, so it varies from state to state. And they tend to be a relatively common invertebrate species in um, a variety of zoo and aquaria touch tanks and other exhibits. So those images there show horseshoe crabs being bled and then that blue bottle is their hemolymph or their blood. So they have a copper-based blood um, versus iron uh, with ours, with mammals. So this slide here is just <laughs> listing all of the, I mean I love this photo, um, listing all of, that's not quite how it happens and John will go into more detail. And they, they do get a sticker I think. But, um, but yeah, so, so they're screened with the, the limulus amoeba, LA, our limulus amoebocyte lysate screens, injectable drugs, all um, vaccines, sterile water that's used to resuspend injectable drugs, and anything that goes into a human, pacemakers, other surgical implants are all screened with this extract to make sure they're not contaminated so they're safe for us. Prior to the horseshoe crab, live rabbits were used, and if the rabbit developed a fever, then we knew that the drug or something was bad. Um, but now we don't do that um, in the U.S. so much. Um, it's also a very rapid test in a hospital setting for bacterial meningitis in people, so it's really important. It's a much quicker test than what had occurred in the past, along with urinary tract infections. And then in some countries, they use another part of the extract to screen for systemic fungal diseases, which can make people very sick. 
So just so everyone gets on the same page here about their anatomy. Um, so this is a horseshoe crab looking at it from above, and they have this hard chitinous shell. They also have, um, this will work, their compound eyes here. So there's the one on the side of the eyes, and their shells divide into three sections. So this first part here is the prosoma, um, and then, or the cephalothorax. The middle part here is the epistosoma, or the abdomen, um, and right here is the hinge, so that's sort of where they bend. The center area here is the arthroidal membrane, which is a little soft tissue area, which is how we access their heart. Um, and their heart is just long tubular organ that lies right under here. And then the third part of them is the tail or the telson. And then they have these spines, which are non-venomous, but just anti-predator defense mechanism. And looking at these guys from below, they have five sets of legs, and then they have these little chelicera, I don't know if you can see them there, just like spiders have. And they use that to put food into their mouths right there. The first set of appendages in these guys are called the pedipalps, and this is a female crab, and then here's a male. So the mature animals differ in that the females, their first set of appendages looks just like the other pincers, whereas the male, um, they're altered to be this bulbous structure, just like in tarantulas, this is bulbous structure, and um, that's used to hook onto the female right back here during the spawning season. So that's how we can tell a mature male from a mature female. Not only are the males typically smaller on average, usually, um, they also have that different appendage. So the respiratory system, we can see it here. They have this set of book gills. Um, the top part of the book gill, because I'll be referring to this a little bit later, it's called the operculum, just like a fish operculum or the covering of the book gills. And then they have five sets of book gills that lay almost like pages in a book, thus the name, um, similar to the book lungs in the spider. So I just want to touch on a couple more systems. So vision, they're really well studied for um, using their compound eyes as a model for some human vision. And they're the only chelicerate um, that actually has compound eyes. The others do not. They have somewhere around seven eyes on top of the shell, a couple eyes around their mouth, and then a, a lot of photoreceptors on the tail. And again, Nobel Prize in Physiology with vision, using them as a model. I already mentioned the heart. The other thing about them that's interesting compared to other chelicerates would be that they're the only ones that can handle solid food. So they can eat a large piece of dead fish or something else and then they can macerate it and, and deal with it um, versus the others that cannot. Their immune system is important to keep in mind because it plays an important role for a lot of things and why they may experience challenges in captivity. So unlike us, they cannot form antibodies. So they only have the innate immune system part and not the humoral immunity, so they cannot form antibodies. So their main blood cell, the amoebocyte, has these defense molecules inside that are released in the presence of pathogens, and they release different enzymes and things to deal with it. So it's really important that they have a high enough amoebocyte count or cell count um, to be able to fight off things they experience in captivity and, and in the wild. And I took these, a lot of these photos. Um, that do not have credits are ones that I took on Slaughter Beach in Delaware. So if anyone has seen the horseshoe crabs in Delaware, it's amazing. So they actually lined up like that. I did not uh, prop them like that. Um, so a little bit about conservation, which um, is an important subject for these guys for a lot of reasons. There have been documented population declines since the 90s in terms of published work. There have been many studies done in many different states, Delaware Bay, has been the ones to lead the role, but also New Jersey, South Carolina. I did some work on Cape Cod responding surveys. They are listed by um, the International Union of, for the Conservation of Nature, so the group that keeps the red list of where different species are at. They're considered near threatened, so the lowest is um, you know, least concern, then near threatened, and then it goes up from there. So they're not super high in the list of concern with that list, but they're definitely not normal in normal standing. Now there's three other species of horseshoe crab in the world, and they're all over, um, over by Japan and the Pacific, and those three species are definitely um, have some significant population declines because they eat them over there, and there's serious pollution affecting those, those species. So, um, but for the American horseshoe crab, it's not considered in as much trouble as those other species. So pictured here is the beautiful red knot, so one of the shorebirds that's intimately tied to the horseshoe crab eggs um, as they come up um, from the south for their spring migration, they're f feasting on the horseshoe crab eggs. So a study that I worked on when prior to veterinary school, when I was working for the Massachusetts Audubon Society, 
Uh, it was a multi-organizational study that was a lot of fun, working with the National Park Service, the University of Rhode Island School of Oceanography, and Fish and Wildlife Service. We did a large-scale population demographic study of horseshoe crabs on Cape Cod. It started around 2000, and it went for a couple of years. And we did large-scale spawning surveys and multiple embayments on Cape Cod, along with a large-scale tagging study. Um, so we typically um, went out at the new and full moon high tides at night and during the day, so it was fun going at one in the morning at the high tide with volunteers, but it worked out well, no one got hurt. And um, we uh, went out with these quadrats and counted the number of crabs that we saw, and we calculated spawning densities among the embayments. We also tagged them, mostly with these T-bar tags. So these are used for uh, lobsters, they're used for fish. They're almost like your clothing tag. Um, and we tagged the end of the persom in this little area right here with these tags. And we tagged just shy of 8,000 over two years, and um, we found some interesting results. There was definitely significant differences um, among the embayments. So I was working in Cape Cod Bay and Wellfleet Harbor. We had Pleasant Bay on Cape Cod, along with Nauset Marsh, and then Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. And we found that there were significant differences in the sizes of the crabs. So the crabs in Monomoy were much bigger than the horseshoe crabs that were in Cape Cod Bay. And it's thought that the Delaware Bay is the epicenter of the horseshoe crabs, um, evolutionarily. And as you go north and south, they get smaller. And we found that um, as we went north on Cape Cod, they became smaller. And we found differences in the sex ratios, um, unfortunately. So many fewer females, for instance, in Pleasant Bay versus other spots. And we found that majority of the animals like to stay where we found them. So even within years and among years, they didn't travel very far from the original tagging beach. So it was suggestive of subpopulations or local populations of horseshoe crabs versus them tr trekking out to the continental shelf and then mixing the following season, they tend to like to go back to the same spot. So that had some management implications for harvesting them for bait and also for, for bleeding them as well. And there they are, tagging horseshoe crab. So this is just a map showing just some of the study sites on the Cape for those who aren't familiar. So Cape Cod Bay here, Wellfleet Harbor sites in here. And these little lines are just some of GPS um, monitoring of where we had tagged them and where some of the crabs had traveled to. Um, so here in Pleasant Bay, they kind of stuck with them there. We had one deviant that went over here. This is actually where they bleed horseshoe crabs. And probably that one just got released right there and someone reported the tag. Um, but for the most part, they stayed nearby. So there's some actual positive work going on with trying to develop actually artificial bait instead of using the horseshoe crab for the eel and whelk capture. Um, instead, um, a lab out of University of Delaware, Dr. Nancy Target, has developed um, a pretty cool um, artificial bait that's algae-based, and it uses much less horseshoe crab than previous. A historically, historical use, excuse me. So typically um, a male horseshoe crab is put in a trap and is bleeding and the eel and whelk are attracted to that and then or um, a half of a female per trap. So that's using a lot of horseshoe crabs to, to get the um, other animals and so what they found is they're able to use a lot less and sometimes not use any horseshoe crab instead substitute the introduced Asian shore crab and some other species in this little gelatinous algae piece which is shown right here in the middle and those are all um, whelks coming around. So there's been trials, and there's actually some trials in Massachusetts going on too with trying to see if the eel and whelk of Massachusetts like this artificial bait. So um, that's something that's positive coming out there based on the uh, chemoattractant research. So what pheromones and things the female horseshoe crabs give off that make them so tasty to other invertebrates and species. So shifting gears to talk about the diseases that these guys can encounter in the wild and captivity, there's a variety of things that can happen, just like with any animal. Um, they tend to be pretty, um, pretty resistant to trauma. So at the top image here um, is a horseshoe crab on the beach that had a huge dent in its shell and a full thickness hole right through the prosoma just ahead of the heart. So that was good. So there was no bleeding and um, was active and tracking a female. So they tend to be pretty resilient with trauma, at least in the short term, um, long term, hard to say. Also, they're very susceptible to poor water quality. Even though they can tolerate a wide range of parameters, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily happy in the short term or long term in poor water quality. So it's really important, 
especially in captivity, to give them the same parameters and the same quality of water that we do for keeping fish and other aquatic species. And that's the case for all invertebrates, not just the horseshoe crab. They also can experience developmental changes or poor molts, things like that. And we're finding in captivity they may experience nutritional deficiency, and I'll touch base on that in a minute. Um, they also are very prone to several different infectious diseases um, in the wild and um, captivity algal disease. So there's some species of algae that can just lice through the chitin on the top of the shell and cause problems. Also, they can have parasites just like any other animal. Parasites tend to not cause too much harm unless they're already um, suppressed for some other reason. And then they can develop bacterial and fungal infections. Now, the thing with fungal infections, it has not been documented at all in the wild, so it seems to be something um, isolated to captive individuals. And this horseshoe crab here, this deceased crab, has these little multifocal tan lesions all over, and that is fungal disease. It happens to be Fusarium solani, which is pictured here, and I'll talk about that shortly. So what sort of challenges do we see here at other institutions and, and laboratories in general that keep these guys. So I mentioned they have a wide range of parameters they can tolerate, but it's found that there's a, a certain range that they tend to do better at long term, i.e. live longer, develop fewer lesions. And so listed here just the temperature range, high 50s, high 60s. However, some, some animals do just fine in lower temperatures too, so, but this is just um, something that's been reported. Again, keep them in the same setup as you would for fish, so it's really important to have the right type of filtration and water quality. Now the captive diet is a bit different than the wild diet. So in the wild, they're eating everything from polychaete worms, little purple gemma gemma uh, clams, um, detritus, algae, dead fish. Um, so we don't tend to necessarily have the ability to feed them as varied a diet, but we're working um, with another institution to think about some other things that we can supplement to help them out that way. So it's been linked to a decrease in their blood protein. So just like in mammals, you can measure what your blood protein is at, and it can indicate many different things. We can do that also for the horseshoe crab. It's been correlated with poor health. So as that number drops, it usually indicates that um, they're not doing well. Even though they seem quite active, they may all of a sudden acutely decompensate or become sick um, in the near future. The other thing about keeping them in captivity is have to be careful which substrate we use. Um, sand, crushed coral. Sand they like to bury in, which is great. However, if you have a closed system or semi-closed system, it can be hard to fully disinfect the substrate, and so it can set them up for problems if they have little micro abrasions on their gills or other things that can set them up for pathogen entry, things like that. So um, we have to keep, keep an eye out there. And there's been several studies done that suggest that these guys can be immune suppressed or have decreased immune function in captivity based on that amoebocyte count, so based on that important blood cell, and it tends to get worse as they're kept warmer. And that'll play a role too with how they're kept after they're bled for biomedical bleeding. The ones that are kept too warm tend to not do well, and that's where we get some of the higher mortality percentages with the studies um, from bleeding mortalities for their LAL. Also, again, bacterial and fungal disease is an important one. On the left here is a picture of a sort of the front of the shell of the horseshoe crab, these little pitting areas, and it happens to be a fungal disease, and it's eroding through to the shell, um, and there's just a microscope image of that. So when I was um, at National Aquarium, I did a retrospective study on fungal disease in the animals, and we found that the majority of them succumbed to a fungal infection, Fusarium solani, and um, speaking with other, other institutions, they also had similar problems, and um, so we uh, were able to characterize what the actual pathogen was with some molecular DNA work along with cultures. So again, fungal disease only documented in the captive individuals, so what can we do to better that situation? Um, on the bottom image here is a bunch of gill leaflets that don't look normal. They should look like thin little pages in a book, and instead they're thickened um, and really abnormal. And they can truck along with ab abnormal gills, and you can't even tell until they become lethargic. So definitely, it's, they're very good at hiding illness, just like if anyone has cats. Cats are good at that, too, um, So and wild, other wild animals. So fungal disease, just like in humans, if it becomes systemic or throughout your body, it's very difficult to treat. But we still want to give a try. So any pathologist in the room might enjoy these slides the most. But these are 
biopsy pictures. So picture the shell of a horseshoe crab sliced in half and then little thin slices and those are looked at under the microscope and stained with these special pretty pink and purple stains. And the image on the left is of a normal carapace, which is the term for the shell, just like in a turtle, so they're carapace. And this is nice and normal in that this top layer here, this pink layer, that's the cuticle, so just like on your nail, so it's the top part. And then underneath their shell, they have this what's called the spongy parenchyma, so this like softer tissue that lies under there. And all those little purple dots are the amoebocytes, so those are their normal inflammatory cells. Now when the horseshoe crab has like a little erosion, whether it's bacterial or fungal, the actual shell looks really abnormal under the microscope. And this is a shell that is affected with fungal disease. So instead of the cuticle looking nice like this, it's very, it's thickened, it has this abnormal pink stuff, which is actually dead tissue, and all those little objects are all fungal organisms that have invaded into the shell. And so, um, and the underlying area here doesn't look nice and clear like this, it looks all thickened, and so there's more of those purple cells in there, and there's more of this abnormal tissue too. So, um, even if something looks like a little erosion, it can look um, as bad as this under the microscope, and then we worry about it then going from underneath the shell and going into other organs and systems. Here's a picture of their gills, um, where we're looking at individual little pages in the book. So little individual leaflets, and these little thin areas are normal book gills. So those are the normal little leaflets. So their blood flows through there so they can breathe. And the other is, is these thickened areas, and it's blown up, magnified right there, and that thickened tissue um, is extremely abnormal. So there's fungus in there, there's more inflammatory cells, more amoebocytes, so you can imagine that this not much room for the, their blood to flow through versus this little leaflet above that V stands for the vascular channel so it's where blood hemolymph flows through and so that's normal that's abnormal so fungal disease definitely uh, takes a toll on them and bacterial diseases too can do the t this to them as well so here at the New England Aquarium we use horseshoe crabs in a few different venues we have a couple touch tank exhibits where they're housed with the elasmobranchs. I promise they're in here. There's just, that day I took the photo, none wanted to show up. Um, so they're in there with the rays and the sharks, and then they're also in um, a cooler system with invertebrates on the third floor, the tidal pool. We also use them for off-site educational programs. They're taken to a variety of schools for children to learn about conservation, cool invertebrates, and, and other topics. And also they're used for on-site educational um, live animal programs as well. So based on my experience in Baltimore and um, discussing things with other institutions, definitely um, we have a variety of protocols in place to minimize the animal's physiologic stress um, with handling um, and things like that and, and use. So for instance, I tend to not like to keep them out of the water longer than a minute or so. There has been a study that showed that they experience severe metabolic derangements at five minutes out of the water and they take longer than you would think to recover once you put them back in water. So to minimize that sort of stress, on a day-to-day -day basis, we tend to do exams with them still submerged and, and other protocols where just the touch tanks to just touch them, not pulling them out of the water. Also, again, even in the tank systems that they travel out to the schools, we monitor water quality in those closed systems as well and make changes as needed for that. And um, we have them all individually tagged, which I'll show you in a minute, and that way we can identify them as individuals, and so we are not going to overuse them um, instead of, they're definitely not taken out every day, but instead a couple times a week to prevent overuse when they go out to the schools for programs. So this upper right shows an epoxy tag there. This is 005. Um, and so that way we can keep track of them and keep track of their health. We do perform every three month exams on them. Not quite as frequently as the marine mammals, but close. So they do get quite a bit of care. So we do hands-on exams, we monitor their weight, watch for any abnormal behaviors, and on occasion we'll draw a small blood sample from one of their limb joints for checking that total protein I was mentioning. And then additional things that we do, besides checking their blood, which is right there, that's that normal blue color, is, is we'll treat animals that have lesions or other problems. So we've tried a variety of things here and other institutions have with both systemic drugs, systemic antibiotics and antifungals, along with topical treatments. We've done a variety of analgesics. I've used everything from morphine to ketamine and other drugs in them, um, and they tolerate the drugs quite well and actually sedates them. 
And this is, image is one that had received some morphine for this procedure, had a injury to the operculum, so the, that cover over the gills. And so we sedated this animal and debrided it, trimmed it back, and threw some sutures in there and handled things just fine. So that's just one of the traumatic type injuries that we can fix in captivity. Um, we also do parasite control. They often will come in from the wild with a lot of these flatworm parasites that can potentially be a problem. And so we'll do freshwater dips and some other things to help treat those, and they do quite well. We've also started some preliminary work looking at some, um, a study using a human antifungal drug, voriconazole, um, which is one of the newer human drugs. And we've given it to a few horseshoe crabs and tested what their blood levels are of this drug. So does it get into their system? And if so, what are the levels? And are the levels high enough to be effective in treating a specific fun fungal, fungus organism or any fungal disease? So we found promising preliminary results that they do have high concentrations in their blood after one and two days. So it's promising to use this drug. However, with fungal disease, it can be pretty frustrating because you need to do it for long periods of time. And um, the drugs are relatively expensive as well. Um, but they tolerate it well, and so it's something we can try in the future. So I'm just going to wrap up my part of the presentation. So hopefully you guys all have learned a little bit more about them and that they're really important animals for the general ecosystem health, providing critical food for migratory shorebirds, other species, the loggerhead turtles. Their LAL, or that limulus amoebocyte lysate, is critical for human health. I think probably there's not a single person in the room who hasn't been affected positively in one way or another by these, these animals. They definitely experience some challenges in captivity. We've come quite, a far, quite, quite far from a decade or two ago, but we definitely have some more work ahead of us trying new drugs, new treatments, and options like that, and continuing to improve on their husbandry. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have. I'm going to turn the podium over to John. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to cover the second half, and that is uh, horseshoe crabs and, and human health. <clears throat> I'd like to start with the question, uh, which animal has saved the most human lives? Can anybody guess? There you go. Was it that? Same <laughs> not? Probably not. All right, how about the horseshoe crabs? See a show of hands? Yes? Ah, excellent, excellent. You are correct, or at least according to uh, uh, John Lloyd and John Mitchison, authors of the second book of General Ignorance. Uh, there is a third book, by the way. Um, and in it, they state that if you ever had an injection, you quite possibly owe your life to the humble American horseshoe crab. LEL is used by the pharmaceutical industry to test drugs, vaccines, medical devices, uh, to ensure that they are free of dangerous toxins. Uh, no other test works as easily or as reliably. So I think in the next 30 minutes, we're going to try to prove that they're right. Okay. So what I like to do is just kind of go over the history of pyrogens and pyrogen testing, um, a brief review of gram-negative bacteria and the endotoxins and why they're so important to uh, pharmaceutical companies, the medical device companies, um, the LAL test and how it's used, and of course some of our conservation efforts in South Carolina. Okay, So what are pyrogens? Uh, Webster defines pyrogens as fever producing agents. Uh, for fever reactions to occur, these pyrogenic agents actually have to enter the circulatory system. And as it turns out, the history and development of intravenous therapy is tied very closely to the history of pyrogen research. Okay. So when did it all begin? It actually began in early 1600s with Sir William Christopher, uh, Sir William Harvey's discovery of the circulatory system, um, and the first documented um, attempt to deliver intravenous intravenous solutions to an animal can be attributed to Sir Christopher Wren, where in 1656 he uses a goose quill and pig's bladder to introduce therapeutic agents. And back in the 17 in the 16th, 17th century, the therapeutic agents were wine, ale, and morphine. So very limited, li very limited options there. Uh, just an illustration of Christopher Wren, uh, truly a Renaissance man and remarkable individual. Um, there are two classes of pyrogens, uh, the exogenous pyrogens and the endogenous pyrogens. Now exogenous is a big word and that's for outside the body. So these are foreign, foreign um, you know, uh, 
biologicals or chemicals that are not, you know, that not normally seen in the body. So uh, we've had uh, microbes, bacteria, viruses. We all had um, infections. We had fevers from those infections. There are some chemicals, some hormones, and some antigens that can cause fever. But these exogenous pyrogens do not directly cause the fever. What they do is they initiate an inflammatory response. So our immune cells recognize these objects, these exogenous pyrogens, as foreign, and they react to them. Um, and by react to them, they produce uh, some small peptides uh, that are responsible for mediating uh, the body's uh, inflammatory response, which is fever, coagulation, um, and a bunch of other pathological consequences. Um, the pyrogen research really started with a very, um, very distinguished Danish uh, physician, um, uh, Peter Ludwig Panum. Uh, he wrote volumes on human physiology um, in the late 19th century. But um, uh, Peter Panum is also distinguished by actually uh, being given credit for the very first experiments conducting very structured, very scientific experiments on pyrogens. Uh, he used dogs in these experiments. Apparently, the outcome was not very good for the dogs. But he was using putrefying materials, putrefaction agents, and he was able to demonstrate that the putrefying materials were apparently heat stable with respect to their pyrogen inducing capacity, water soluble, and alcohol soluble. Um, in 1884, Hans Graham, a Danish bacteriologist, developed a differential stain, very important to microbiology. Uh, this staining procedure not only allows you to see organisms under a microscope, he creates two classes of microbes, the gram positives and the gram negatives. The gram pos positives will look purple under the microscope and the gram negatives will look pink under the microscope. Gram-positive organisms are things like staph and strep you probably heard about, and the gram-negative organisms are the E. coli, the Salmonella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Those are the gram-negatives. In 1989, uh, an Italian investigator, Russi, successfully separates crude fever-producing substances from gram-negative bacteria. And in 1892, Richard Pfeiffer, while working with Robert Koch on Vibrio and the toxin that Vibrio produces, the cholera toxin, discovers that there's actually a second toxin. So he was investigating this protein that's released by uh, Vibrio cholera, but discovers that there's another toxin. And this toxin appeared to be anchored to the cell wall, and it was only released upon, uh, upon cell death. And because it was anchored to the cell wall, uh, Pfeiffer named this second toxin as endotoxin. In the late 1800s and early 20th century, uh, with the advent of experimental medicine, uh, we see the development of intravenous solutions, very simple solutions, salt solutions, sugar, sugar solutions. But these solutions, when administered to patients, had a very common problem, and that problem was fever. Uh, the fever that was induced by the infusion of these solutions was so predictable that they call these fevers as injection fevers. And the true nature of injection fevers was established in 1912 by some English investigators, Horton Penfold. Now what made their work so unique was that they used a, an assay, a model, to study fever. And in this case, they used rabbits. And so they developed a rabbit pyrogen model. And by using rabbits, uh, they were able to classify bacteria into the pyrogenic group and the non-pyrogenic group. And it turns out that the gram-negative bacteria produce very intense fever reactions, and the gram-positive bacteria produce uh, no fevers or less intense fevers. Um, Horton Penfold were able to correlate the pyrogenicity of distilled water uh, with bacterial counts where we typically find gram-negative bacteria. So the more gram-negatives in the, in the distilled water, the more intense the fever. And their conclusion was that all injection fevers were due to a filterable, heat-stable, gram-negative bacterial substance. Uh, a great piece of work. Unfortunately, it went unnoticed until 1923. Florence Sievert, a biochemist at the University of Chicago um, actually conducted a series of experiments between 1923 and 1925. She uses a rabbit model as well, very similar uh, to the Horton Penfold model, and she establishes that all injection fevers were due to a filterable, heat stable, gram negative bacterial substance. Now, what made her work even more unique was the fact that she was able to develop a process by which she can create IV solutions that would pass the rabbit pyrogen test model. 
So again, what are pyrogens? You know, some of the more common biological contaminants, again, are viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, complex biologicals. But I've mentioned gram-negative bacterial endotoxins several times. And the, the endotoxins from these organisms are ubiquitous, that is to say they're everywhere in our environment, and they're extremely consequential to pharmaceutical companies and to medical device companies. So what are they? They're the outermost cell wall constituents of gram-negative bacteria. They're everywhere, okay? They're in our water, they're in our food, they're in our stomachs, okay? So if we were to do a pyrogen test on our drinking water, it would fail miserably. Our food is contaminated. Our, st our intestinal tracts are teeming with gram-negative organisms. They belong there, they should be there. As long as these contaminants stay in the digestive tract, you're fine, but when they get into the circulatory system, um, people get sick, very sick. Um, they also withstand uh, terminal sterilization and uh, they can get through the normal you know, filters that would filter out bacteria. So they're, so, they're, they're important to pharmaceutical companies because they're everywhere, um, they, they're hard to get rid of, and it turns out that they're the most pyrogen, potent pyrogen that we know of. At doses of one nanogram per kg will cause a fever. One nanogram is equivalent to one part per billion. So at one part per billion per kg, you're gonna get sick. So they're potent, they're everywhere, and they're hard to get rid of. And this is just a very simple illustration you know, of a gram-negative organism, and those whisker-like projections are the endotoxins that the organisms contain. So when they're actively grown, they release endotoxins. When they die, they release endotoxins. And again, endotoxins are everywhere. Lewis Thomas describes endotoxins fairly accurately. He says that endotoxins are read by our tissues as the worst of the bad news. They're so potent that they, you know, again, induce a very, very potent inflammatory response because uh, our immune cells believe that it signifies the presence of gram-negative bacteria and they will stop at nothing to avoid this threat. So again, extremely potent. So it's very important for pharmaceutical companies to ensure that their products, all those products that are going to see the blood system do not contain these endotoxins. So I described, you know, I mentioned Flora Siebert using methods of producing non-pyrogenic large volume perennial solutions. How did she do it? It's very simple. She used freshly distilled water. She used distilled water to prepare her formula for IV solutions, and she sterilized that water immediately. And she was able to demonstrate that if she used clean water and sterilized the formulation immediately in a sealed container, the, the solution would not elicit a pyrogenic response, okay? And it would remain non-pyrogenic as long as the integrity of the container wasn't compromised. So these studies had a profound impact. First of all, it removed physicians' reluctance to use intravenous, intravenous feeding, okay? It also spawned a whole new industry. Um, as mentioned, my career started with Baxter Healthcare, and I can tell you that Baxter started in 1933 in a garage in Glencoe, Illinois, and their claim to fame was they could produce non-pyrogenic solutions and medical devices on a very, very large scale. Okay, so uh, Florence Siebert works spawned a whole new industry in the decade before uh, World War II. So what's happening right now? So we have this new, e e this medical, we see the rapid development, you know, of medicines. We see a whole new industry being spawned, and we have the winds of war that are blowing out of Europe as well as the Far East. Um, in 1941, USP, the FDA, and the National Institutes of Health actually took, undertook the very first collaborative study of pyrogens. And they utilized filtrates of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a very common gram-negative water organism. They utilized the rabbit model of Hort, Penfold, and Siebert, and they uh, solicited the help of 14 pharmaceutical manufacturers. And uh, a year later, in 1942, in USP-12, we see the first compendial test for pyrogens. And that's an example of a pyrogen test. That's Sharon McDonald, one of my former technicians, actually running the assay. And you can see, you know, the rabbits are set up, and you can see uh, those wires that are the vertical wires. Those are thermocouples, and they're used to rectally probe the animals to monitor uh, temperatures. So it turns out the rabbit was a very, very good choice by uh, Hort, Penfold, and Siebert. Um, some obvious reasons, I guess, why they were used. They're fairly inexpensive, and they're easy to handle. 
But the most important attribute to the rabbit is the fact that it has a very laid biothermal regulatory system, which is to say, if they get excited, or if somebody's, if a rabbit starts reading on a, nibbling on another rabbit's ear, they're going to get excited, they're going to get irritated, they're going to respond with a fever. Okay? So, from the FDA's perspective, they see this as you're more likely to get a false positive with the rabbit test. Okay? The, the, the public health, you know, regulatory, um, uh, you know, concerns are concerned, more worried about false negatives, and that's a situation where you have um, something that could be very pyrogenic, um, and, and it's not seen in a test system. So with the rabbit, you're very, it's very unlikely to get a false negative, more likely to get a false positive. So it's a perfect animal model. And it involves um, taking the rabbit's temperature um, prior to injection, because they're very excitable, so they have to get a stable baseline, okay? And then uh, you monitor the temperature for three hours uh, post-injection. So in all in all, it takes about five hours to, um, to complete a three-rabbit test. And you can see some of their very early uh, IV manufacturing operations. Uh, for those, you know, that are kind of familiar with this, this is kind of a joke because it's much more sophisticated, much more elaborate right now. But you also see how IV therapy was used in World War II and how, you know, this really the significance of Florence Sifa's work. So the, the rabbit test was the official pyrogen test for about 38 years until we see the development of the LAL test. And as, as Kathy has indicated, LAL is an acronym for Elimulus, the genus of the horseshoe crab, amoebocyte, which is the only blood element of the horseshoe crab, lysate, because we take the amoebocytes and we pop them. We're interested in the intracellular proteins. Um, so the, as Kathy had also mentioned, the LAL is a clotting system very important to the horseshoe crab. Um, it actually has two functions, a basic immunological function, also a hemostasis function. So if the crabs are very active and they're injured, you know, in, estu in estuary waters that have very high concentrations of gram-negative bacteria, they're gonna form a clot to, to ward off any sort of major influx, and it also prevents the animal from bleeding out. And LAL is unequivocally recognized as the most sensitive method available for the detection of gram-negative endotoxins, the pyrogen of greatest consequence to pharmaceutical companies. So I'm often asked, well, you know, who came up with this idea? Well, we can attribute that to Dr. Frederick Bang, uh, a physician out of John Hopkins University. Dr. Bang was also very interested in pathomarine biology, or uh, diseases of marine animals. And he thought that if we can study the diseases of marine mammals uh, and, and look at those phenomena, and it might be very much applicable, you know, to clinical conditions. And as it turns out, he was working with Vibrio, Vibrio species again with the horseshoe crab, and he injected the animal um, with Vibrio cholera, and he noticed massive intravascular coagulation. Uh, it was from all gram-negative organisms. He was able to determine that actually it was the endotoxin component of the gram-negative or organisms that you know, initiated this massive uh, in, uh, coagulation response. So he published his, these, uh, these results, these observations in some notes, and it sat in literature for about 10 years. Uh, 10 years later, Dr. Jack Levin, a hematologist um, who had patients dying of overwhelming septic shock, and he asked a very, very basic question. Isn't there something out there that can detect gram-negative endotoxins? So he does a literature search, comes across this paper. Both are from John Hopkins, and they begin to collaborate. Um, and I believe this picture was taken around 1980, a year before uh, Dr. Bang died. Um, and Dr. Bang is here on the left, and Jack Levin is on the right. Jack Levin is uh, very, very active. Um, I saw him just recently in Sasebo, Japan, at an international conference of horseshoe crabs and the, uh, the science and conservation of horseshoe crabs, particularly uh, the Indo-Pacific species. And uh, just an amazing guy, just an amazing guy. I, I, I told him I felt like a 15-year-old kid standing next to a rock star. I mean, he's just so, so bright, so sharp, just an amazing. It's just so exciting to, to, to see him. Um, in 1964, Levin and Bang begin to collaborate, and they start publishing, you know, on the mechanisms by which endotoxin can uh, mediate the coagulation of LAL. Their interest primarily was not only in the mechanisms, but possibly in the development of a clinical test. Okay, and about the same time, uh, Dr. James Cooper, the founder of our company, he also was at John Hopkins, and his interest was in radiopharmaceutical. These are these are radioactive agents that are used in cancer diagnosis to this day. 
Uh, they have extremely short half-lives, typically around 15 minutes. And at the time, there was no pyrogen test for these injectable products. And the reason there was no pyrogen test is because the rabbit test took about five hours to conduct. And these are very short-lived agents. And after five hours, there'd be nothing left to give to the patients. So he was aware of this technology. And he actually applied it to these radiopharmaceuticals and published that in 1971. And he was able to demonstrate that actually the LAL test was about 10 times more sensitive to endotoxins than the rabbit test. Well, that got the attention uh, of some people at the FDA, Dr. Hochstein and Seligman and Dr. Cooper, and together they looked at about 155 biologicals and radiopharmaceuticals, and they did parallel testing with rabbits as well as this new LAL method, and their conclusion was that an LAL was a rapid, sensitive, and reproducible method for detecting bacterial endotoxins. Okay. Um, that got the interest. You know, of pharmaceutical companies around the world, they said, whoa, we could replace all these rabbits with a very simple in vitro test. And so it was very exciting. And uh, the, the test uh, was actually the first publication was in 1972, and it took about 15 years for the agency to accept it. They, were, they allowed for its use, but it's limited use, but they were very cautious. Um, and it took about 15 years of massive data, massive collaboration to demonstrate that, in fact, um, the, the endotoxin is the pyrogen of greatest concern to pharmaceuticals and, the, and that the LAL test uh, was, can successfully detect these, you know, these endotoxins. So how is it used um, in pharmaceutical companies? It's certainly used, again, in the, you know, in the production and the testing of water for injection. Water for injection is absolutely critical. It's typically produced by distillation, can be also be produced by reverse osmosis, but it's used in cleaning of, of pharmaceutical equipment. It's used in sanitizing pharmaceutical equipment, and of course it's used in the formulation of injectable pharmaceuticals. Um, the other test is also used to test the, all the ingredients that go into uh, a pharmaceutical preparations. That would be the active agents, or perhaps some of the inactive agents that are added and it's actually used to wash and test medical devices. So I have a picture here of an IV bag, and you can see that, uh, obviously, that, that the solution inside that IV bag uh, is going to be tested for LEL, right? Well, that IV bag is connected to the patient by that uh, administration set that you see right over here, OK? Well, the fluid path of that administration test has to be tested for the absence of, LA, uh, absence of endotoxin as well. Um, that administration set is connected to a cannula that sits in the patient's you know, vein here. Well, that's part of the d drug delivery system. That also sees blood, or has access to the circulatory system. So that has to be tested for the absence of endotoxins. And the needle used in a venipuncture obviously has to be tested for the absence of, 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 of endotoxins. So the IV bag, the administration set, the cannula, they all are part of the drug delivery system. All have to be tested to ensure that they're safe for intravenous use. And again, you know, IV solutions, antibiotics, vaccine, anything that's injectable, anything that's going to see blood, uh, implantable devices, you know, anything that's going to see blood uh, will have to be tested uh, for the absence of endotoxins. So there are three types of tests. There's the very simple gel clot test, the original test. Uh, there are more sophisticated tests. Uh, it could be looking at the formation of gels kinetically uh, with, uh, with instruments and computers. And there's even more sophisticated tests that involves some color changes. And then uh, most recently, there's a cartridge-based test system. And this is basically the general equipment required for a gel clot test. Uh, we've got uh, an LEL reagent. We've got uh, some control standard endotoxin to be able to confirm performance of the test. We've got a lot of samples and tubes, but not a whole lot of money here. It's pretty simple, you know, and, and, and it can, and has been used very successfully. Um, the drawback is that it takes about an hour, and you're really dealing with pluses or minuses, and it's hard to do, you know, to work with pluses or minuses, um, and it's all completely manual, okay? And you know the more the the, the kinetic methods. Uh, now you're you're dealing with um, you know tube readers or micro titer plate readers. So you've got some uh, fancy equipment that's going to be attached to a computer, okay? Uh, which will have an application, a, a dedicated software application that take that information, um, analyze that information, create reports, uh, send that information to some sort of 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 uh, tracking system. 
uh, so you can really understand your system, you know, your, your processes, your critical systems in a manufacturing environment, uh, much more sophisticated. And of course, the cartridge-based test system that was just recently um, approved in 2006 uh, you know, by the FDA. Uh, that's our technology, and uh, we've made the LEL test very simple, very easy, very quick, and very rapid. Um, and it's very important in this day of age. Uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing is becoming much more complicated. Uh, the products are protein-derived products, so they're targeted protein therapies, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, it's uh, fabulously expensive, <laughs> crazy expensive, but remarkable technology. And the expectations are that pharmaceutical manufacturers truly understand their process, to, and, and it requires a lot of uh, in-process testing, and uh, they need a test that's rapid, quantitative, and be able to do at the point of, you know, at the point of sampling. So process understanding and process control is absolutely critical uh, to pharmaceutical manufacturing. So there are approximately 70 million LEL and TAL tests that are performed each year. TAL is an acronym for technically as amoebocyte lysate. Uh, so 70 million tests. And to date, there's been no con FDA confirmed outbreaks of, of products where the LAL has missed something. The LAL has been used for 40 years very successfully. So while there may have been some recalls, uh, those are more process failures, sampling failures. The LAL test did not fail. So our industry is highly regulated. Um, we're, you know, we have to follow uh, the CFR and with respect to guidelines and current uh, good manufacturing pr practices. We're subject to FDA, uh, regular FDA inspections because we provide the tools that are used by pharmaceutical companies worldwide in a very official capacity that are, that are actually part of the release testing of pharmaceutical drugs and devices. Okay? So I want to spend a little bit of time about conservation efforts and what we've done in South Carolina. Um, obviously, uh, the horseshoe crab is extremely important to us. It's extremely important to our pets. It's extremely important because they too, anything that goes into animals is also LEL tested. Uh, so it's extremely important to the biomedical community. And as uh, Kathleen has said, it's also extremely important to, to shorebirds. So I think it's our responsible, you know, it's our responsibility to ensure the sustainability you know, of the limitless crabs. And in 1991, there were no laws dealing uh, with horseshoe crabs and conservations. And the increasing demand you know, for Limulus um, actually allowed um, you know, Dr. Cooper and his wife Frances Cooper to work with DNR and together they enacted legislation in 1991 to protect the horseshoe crab. These are, you know, these, this is the law, the code of law for the state of South Carolina. Um, in addition to our FDA license, we have to have a license to possess the animals. Our fishermen, our suppliers, have to have permits to provide us with animals. Um, baiting is prohibited. Baiting has been prohibited since 1991, so we we're about seven or eight years ahead of the curve, ahead of Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission. Uh, we harvest by hand. We don't like to trawl for crabs. Uh, trawling can lead to a lot of stress, a lot of injuries, increased mortality. It's not good for the crabs. It's not good for us. So we harvest by hand. and. Um, you know, we have to return the animals alive, okay? Um, and we do so very quickly. Probably within about, you know, six to eight hours of receipt, the horseshoe crabs are back in the water. That is something that I manage. And uh, virtually every aspect from harvesting to transport to bleeding to return is, is really regulated, you know, in South Carolina. So, um, you know, I think the most recent surveys done by Atlantic States uh, marine fish, fishery commissions and also studies done by our Department of Natural Resources. This is really over the course of the last 10 years has demonstrated that our population of horseshoe crab is actually increasing. So our industry does not have an impact on horseshoe crab populations. When it's managed and managed well, you know, you can have thriving populations and that's the situation in South Carolina. So in addition to not baiting the animals and harvesting by hand and regulating every aspect of her, we have eight islands you know, in the South Carolina area, uh, Charleston area, excuse me, where we cannot go. These are, these are uh, sanctuaries where our fishermen cannot go. Uh, two of these islands are in Cape Romaine. 
uh, a national wildlife ref refuge, and six of these islands are in the Ace Basin area, just south of, uh, south of Charleston. So we've got eight islands here where we can't go to, and our, again, our population um, is increasing, and we've been uh, recognized as having the best demonstrated uh, practices for horseshoe crab um, fishery management. So what I'd like to do, you know, I think I've hopefully convinced you that the authors of the second book of General Ignorance were, were absolutely correct. Uh, the horseshoe crab is, you know, very remarkable. But we also have um, another customer that's not in the pharmaceutical companies, uh, and that would be NASA. And uh, they're actually using LEL and for two programs, planetary protection and life uh, detection, astrobiology. So very quickly, so when uh, these space probes in, um, are being assembled, uh, there's a very big concern about contaminating outer regions of space with earth, you know, with earth organisms. Um, and they, they culture uh, the, these vessels uh, on a regular basis during assembly, and the traditional culture methods take anywhere between three to five days. So they're looking for more rapid tests, and, and the cartridge-based test system is being used um, actually for uh, spacecraft assembly. And it's also being used on the International Space Station. What you see here is the official mission patch worn by the astronauts. It was part of their uh, lab on a chip, you know, portable test system development and uh, Charles River Laboratories, Marshall's, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and the Carnegie Institute at Washington, D.C. Uh, the mission was launched on December 9, 2006. And you have uh, Sonny Williams here actually performing one of the first um, LAL tests at zero gravity. And I think Sonny was here just about a month ago talking about her experiences in space. So it's, uh, uh, it's you know, LAL is apparently not only important to pharmaceutical companies but also to NASA. So I'd like to add um, just one more slide here, and it's really about the sensitivity of the LEL test, and that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Just crazy sensitivity. This is where I usually ask if there are any chemists in the room. Uh-oh, I'm going to say some bad things, okay? Um, you know, I know chemists, you know, they like their, their big pieces of equipment. They got their mass specs, and they got the H, you know, crazy expensive, and they got you know, HPLC columns, you know, and they tout sensitivities, okay, and they go, we can get down to a one part per billion. And I said, well, actually, that's pretty good, but the LEL, got you, LEL test has got you beat by about three orders of magnitude because we're in the parts per trillion, okay? So one part per trillion is one zero with, uh, one with 11 zeros in front of it in a decimal point. Uh, it's equivalent to one second in 320 centuries or a grain of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Biology is very cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the first question is, how advanced is their nervous system? It's a great question. So they don't have um, the same type of nervous system as we do, invertebrates do not in general, but they do have a central brain-like organ, and they have little nerves that come off. So they're not as advanced as the vertebrates, so the animals with backbones, but they do have nerves. So I don't know who asked that question. So yeah, so they definitely respond to negative stimuli. So the question that I get sometimes is do they feel pain? And so I think maybe that was what you were maybe trying to get at with this, yeah. So um, we don't know. They're not gonna process it like we process pain. Um, but they do have many axons and other nervous structures, so since we don't know, I always like to assume that maybe they can, and so if we're doing something painful or, or they have some injury, we definitely give them pain medications where we can. We don't know necessarily if they're going to work or not. I have seen them become sedate on them, so I think some of them do work, but um, I always like to say if we don't know, it's better to err on saying yes, potentially they could feel pain, but we don't know. But good question. How far do they travel in a day, month, or year? Um, another great question. Over the course, at least our tagging studies, they found that they traveled typically less than two kilometers. So I have to switch that to miles if anybody knows. I think kilometers. Anyway, so typically they don't travel too, too far if you consider that short distance. Um, it's thought though that. Just over a mile. It's 1.6 kilometers. One point, over a mile. Just over a mile. Okay, so typically they didn't travel much more than a mile, at least during the spawning season on Cape Cod. However, um, it is thought that some of them go out to the continental shelf and overwinter there, so that would be many miles. So it depends is my answer. Uh, what are their predators? 
a great question. So the loggerhead sea turtle is a predator of them. We've definitely seen them um, recently in a loggerhead sea turtle that we um, did an autopsy on um, a few months ago. It was loaded with horseshoe crabs and so it was feasting on them in Cape Cod Bay because it was a cold stunned stranded sea turtle. Um, other predators would be sharks um, and uh, yeah so those are the two that come to mind first. And our horseshoe crabs, crabs. Another question for me. The question. Um, yeah, the short term. Uh, excuse me. The, typically, we'll call them crabs as short term, but they're not really true crabs, so they're not crustaceans. So we asked that's a great question. Um, so typically, they're uh, more related to spiders and scorpions, and not true crabs. So another great question. Why are their numbers lessening in New England? That's a good question. I don't know. I only have numbers from a few years ago. I haven't, I don't know what the current status is. I know one of my colleagues that I work with in the 2000s on that project has not been able to do recent spawning surveys because of funding. Um, however, so I don't know the actual status of them in Massachusetts from year to year, but definitely the worry is, is their numbers can be lessened because they're harvested for bait. Now, currently in Massachusetts, at least myself knowing the Cape Cod region, just like in South Carolina, there's areas where harvest is off limits. So in the National Park Service, they cannot be harvested for bait or biomedical. Um, and for instance, in the Pleasant Bay body of water, they can only be harvested for biomedical and not bait. And then many other places on Cape Cod, they're harvested for both. So anecdotally, somebody recently mentioned they felt that they were less in those, those unprotected areas. So um, it might just be because of different pressures pressure shifting based on some of those changes. But um, great question, but I don't know the specific numbers. So um, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries would be the ones that would have all that data. I miss seeing these guys on the beaches here, period. Why do they not come here? Is it because of over harvesting? So yeah, so it depends. Um, great question. It depends what, where, what beach you're at and when you're going to see them. Um, definitely numbers are less than they were. Um, 30, 40 years ago, um, at least up here. And I think it ties back to my previous answer. So um, harvesting for bait is going to be a big one. So, yep, great questions. You said that the harvesting in South Carolina is done by hand. Yep. How is that done or where, more specifically, where is it done and by whom? They're done by fishermen that are permitted. Um, they're done typically at the high evening tides at night, so that might be at nine o'clock at night. It might be at four in the morning. Okay, uh, these guys will actually face inclement weather as well. They'll take a pounding sometimes. Um, it's hard work. It's very very hard work. But typically, they're in the in the waters up to their knees, you know, along the shoreline or in the marshes as well. Um, and you know, they're just there in the knees, and they've got little John boats, and they pick them up and they place them in the boats. Uh, and then it's usually brought to a bigger vessel where it's then transported to our facility. Um, the, we, we, we make sure that there's an economic advantage in taking care of, of you know, how they handle the animals because we don't pay for injured crabs. So if they're mishandled, you know, they're losing money and fishermen don't like to lose money. Good question. Um, we have done tagging studies, uh, several tagging studies, where we've tagged thousands of animals uh, in successive years. Um, each season, you know, we you know we keep a record of the animals that you know we recover that have been tagged. Uh, we'll bleed them and kind of send them on their way again. Um, there was and every at the end of every season, I have these monster Excel spreadsheets. But I you know for the tags, I'll do an Excel sort on them. And a couple of times I've discovered that I actually bled the animal twice and I didn't know it, okay? And uh, the, the interval between bleedings was about six to eight weeks. Obviously they use the LAL test during you know, GLP and GMP mm -hmm. um, work. But so how far back in research does that go? Like, I mean, preclinical studies where you're injecting stuff into animals and you're getting a fever response and, and other pathological responses. I mean, do you really, cause how do you tell between what your drug is doing and what something that's not your drug is doing. Yeah, I've brought that point up many, many, many times. 
you know, when you're, when you're doing some animal work. Depends on the animal. Um, well, so the company that I was working at uses rabbits. Right. And so when you guys talked about that, I was like, well. Absolutely, <laughs> ab absolutely. And if they experience a fever response, how do you know it? Is it from the drug? Is it from the stress? Or is it because it's contaminated? Um, and I don't think there's a whole lot of endotoxin testing done at the preclinical work, which to me is a huge mistake. Right. Yeah. Um, so your first question was, what are the purposes or of all the eyes? Um, I don't know the answer to all that. I do know what the compound eyes are used for. They're mostly to, to find mates in the mating season is the compound eyes, and then they have simple eyes that detect UV light and other photoreceptors, so that's the best answer I have. Um. We're required to get it back in the water within 24 hours, okay? We're by law. We try to, I try to keep it to six or eight. Okay, and it's just a matter of scheduling. So I've got, I, I schedule the fishermen to come in at, at different times. So that minimizes, you know, their time out of the water. We haven't seen any effect in, in South Carolina. No dissolving. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Interesting. Again, our population is increasing. Okay. okay, the question was whether or not a, a recombinant product will replace uh, the LEL, and I think the agency's kind of ruled on that. Uh, they don't regulate recombinant proteins, they regulate LEL, you know. Um, the, the, the actual, um, you know, reaction, you know, that takes place, you know, with the, with the, um, you know, with the LEL reagent is very complicated. Uh, it involves sequential activations of many enzymes, not just one enzyme, but many enzymes. And with that sequential activation, just like in other biological systems, you get a tremendous amplification in the response, which is why it's extremely sensitive. There are comp other components in LEL that we're not sure about what they do. Um, so what we do know is that LEL has been used successfully for 40 years. One of the big issues that I have, you know, with some of these other alternate methods, is really the failure of some of these really large studies. These are, you know, I'm talking about studies that uh, involved, you know, many industries, uh, many pharmaceutical companies, collaborations with Health Industry Manufacturing Association, for example, or PDA, where they took massive amount of tests and compared it, you know, to real contaminated samples. Uh, using rabbits and, and using LEL, and over the course of hundreds of thousands of tests, they were able to demonstrate that there, not in one instance, was there a situation where the LEL passed and the rabbit failed. What happened is that LEL failed many products and it passed the rabbit test. So, I mean, it, it has a long and successful track record. I think one more round of applause for our speaker. What's that? Chow time, that's what that is. That is a very, very big lion's mane jelly and they are absolutely delicious, apparently. 